Welcome to the best commander podcast in the world and another archetype deep dive. This time we're looking at aristocrats and seeing what makes it tick. I'm your host, Joe Cherries. I'm your host, Beezy, and that makes us the nitpicking nerds. As you may know, this is a podcast, the greatest podcast about Commander, the greatest podcast about Commander in the entire world. You can find it on Spotify, Google, and iTunes, anywhere podcasts are sold, except only those three places. This is probably, let's say you're, you can't watch YouTube. Let's say you're at a, you're at a, a grocery store, right? Okay. And it's getting robbed and you have to beat down the robbers with your bare hands. This is the podcast you want to be listening to. Yeah. I mean, what were you listening to while you were beating them down? The Picky Nerd, the best commander podcast in the world. Yeah, put that in the police report. Oh, yeah. Uh, what's this video about? Uh, it's about <laughs> aristocrats, actually. We're going to talk about everything that has to do with aristocrats. We're going to answer the questions and tell you how to play it, what you need, and what it's all about. Cool. Before we get in, we got to define what an aristocrats deck actually is so that we can talk about it. So it is a style of deck that aims to use sacrificing creatures as a main source of card advantage and as a win condition. Okay, so that means we're going to be sacking creatures. That means we're going to need sack outlets, stuff like that. And we're going to just jump into it and see what do we need. We're going to answer questions about how to play this deck. All right, first question. What are some of the key players in the Aristocrats deck? Well, first you need some sack outlets. Uh, sacrificing is a huge thing in Aristocrats deck, as we just mentioned. So you need sack outlets, ways to take your creatures, put them in the graveyard at your will. Next, you need death triggers. You need, when creatures die, something needs to happen. Otherwise, you're just putting creatures in your graveyard, and that seems awful. And what's the last thing we need? Well, we need expendable creatures, and these are premium. You can't just play a 2-2 two -two for 2 with no text and then sacrifice it. All you are getting is whatever mild upside the sacrifice provides. We need to, let's say, have a card make three one ones instead, and then they all do something when they die because of another card, and then the card we sacrifice them with gives us a card back or deals with one of our opponent's creatures, and it's just you play one card and you get like six cards worth of value. Exactly. You need to be getting a ton of value per card and not just a 2-2 two -two that drew you a card because now you just wasted two mana to draw a card. You can drip. That's not very good. Yeah, it's not worth it. So why isn't it so important to have a sack outlet at all times, which is what we talk about? Well, you need to protect yourself from board wipes uh, and get maximum value before losing your creatures prevent, and you don't want... You're really in this first cast deck. You don't want them to be exiled or bounce. You really want to put them into your graveyard to get that value. If they get exiled, you don't get the value at all. If they go back to your hand, you don't get the value at all. And now your hand's filled with dummies that you got to replay. Yeah, a lot of a lot of aristocrats' fodder is tokens, so they go away. Mm -hmm. And if you have effects that say when a creature dies, you get an effect. Well, they don't trigger on being bounced or exiled. So you need a, a sack outlet to just stop shenanigans, sometimes even... Your commander can get like stranded somewhere underneath an aura or get like exiled and you don't want to put it there or you want to put it in the command zone. You can just have a free sack outlet. You don't have to worry about any of that stuff. Exactly. Spot removal comes out and if it's an exile spell, you put it in your graveyard. If it's a bounce spell, you put it in your graveyard. This is what you want to do. You want to be putting things into your graveyard and at your own rate. If you have a ton of abilities in the field, you want to be able to sack them when you want to, and not wait for a board wipe to just knock them to the graveyard. Well, even if a board wipe's going to send them to the graveyard anyway, you now have, let's say you have eight creatures, they're all about to die no matter what, get eight benefits from it mm -hmm. out of the sack outlet, whatever that might be. Yes, exactly. So if we need a sack outlet at all times, but they're really redundant, how many should you actually play? Well, it's tough to come up with an exact number. We went with 7 to 12. That's a general range. We looked through our decks, and we really we saw like what we play and how we felt about them. It just, and it's going to depend on the deck, really. Um, some decks are going to want 12. You're going to really need it every single time. Some decks are going to want 7. You don't need it as often. By sack outlets, we just mean a repeatable way to sacrifice creatures. They don't all have to be Viscerous Seer. They don't all have to be Sacrifice Creature colon, like free to do that you can do any number of times. Mm -hmm. Some of them can be once a turn or two colon. You know, you want to diversify, but you... At least five should be, like, free. Yeah, you want you want a bunch of free ones um, because you want to be able to just sacrifice creatures willy-nilly. You can't hold up mana to pay, like, one extra mana to scry one. It's, like, a thousand times worse than just sacking a creature. Yeah, and there's a lot of budget ones, too. I think that's great. Uh, I love that you can. there's ones that are super expensive, like Ashnaz Altar, and there's just really cheap ones, Viscerous Seer and Carrion Feeder. And there's, like, Demir Houseguard, uh, Cartel Aristocrat. We'll talk about those 
not all of them, but we'll talk about them later. Uh, what death triggers should we look for? Because I just mentioned having them. So what are we actually talking about? All right, so there's a bunch we're looking for. Uh, good ones. Uh, when a creature dies, draw a card. These are your Midnight Reapers. These are your Grim Horror Specs. They're both really, really strong in these type of decks. Whenever a creature dies, deal damage or cause life loss. These are your uh, Blood Artist and Zulaport Cutthroats. There's plenty more. When a creature dies, uh, you make tokens or creatures. This uh, Sifter of Skulls comes to mind, and then there's Pawn of Ulamog. And then there's like Dictate of Erebos. When a creature dies, everybody else sacrifices a creature. So now you just turn into like a Plague Wind. Yeah, exactly. So you, any of those are really good. There's other ones. Um, these aren't the only death triggers you're going to look for, but these are genuinely the best kind. Yeah, and when we say Aristocrat's deck is trying to sacrifice creatures and gain value, that leads to how we're actually going to win, which is infinite loops, critical mass combos, and just, I have too much stuff, I win. Well, that's critical mass. <laughs> critical mass. Yes. I'm defining critical mass with stupid words. I'd say critical mass is the main way you're going to win with Aristocrat's. You're just gonna, there's going to be so many creatures on the board that... If they die, somebody dies, and that's how you're generally going to kill players. Yeah, you can even hold people hostage, X, not even on purpose. Like, say, okay, I have 13 creatures, you're at 13 life. You better hope the board doesn't get wiped. If they have the board gets wiped, I can just choose to kill you if I want. Yeah, or you might have enough that you could choose anyone. So no one wipes the board, and you just win anyway. Let's move on and talk about the colors or commanders you can play with an Aristocrats deck. First thing first, the primary color of Aristocrats decks is black. You have... The most death triggers, the most sacrifice outlets, the most payoffs. It kind of ties everything together. I don't know if you can do it without black. You really can't. Um, black is is the aristocrat's color. If you want to play some second colors, red for Rakdos, we got white for Orzov. Sometimes they go up to like three colors for like a Jun type deck. Yep. So let's just run down some commanders. Uh, Yogmoth, Thran Physician, is completely insane because he's a sack outlet and almost kind of like a death trigger. It doesn't trigger when creatures die, but when you sack it, you just draw a card. Yeah, this card's completely insane. He's one of the best ones. He's in mono black. I mean, this card is completely stupid. Draw a card, put a minus one counter on a creature, and he can proliferate, and he's only four mana. <laughs> and he critical masses with undying creatures. Once you have enough stuff, if one of your creatures has undying, you just win. Yeah, this card is completely insane. Yeah. Next we have Shire, Sizo's Caretaker. This is a weird one. This is more of like its own like combo type thing where you're going to play a bunch of one drops, but still very strong. Yeah, you're just going to sack them over and over. All right, sack all this stuff. Come back, come back, come back, and then, you know, eventually just win. Judith, Scourge Diva, that's the one of the Rakdos go-tos. It does a nice buff for all your little dumb guys. So maybe you could like chip in some attack damage, and then it also wants you to mostly play non non-tokens because then... They'll deal damage when she dies, so she's a death trigger. Yeah, it is a little sad that the non-token part in this really makes this card just so close to being amazing. Because if it's not non-token, this card is super good, but instead, she makes you build a little weird for aristocrats. You would have built this deck if it was non-token. Yes, I would have. Uh, but I did it because it is not non-token. Um, next, we have Alendra the Dusk Rose, who recently was errata to be much, much better. She got accidentally buffed, because now when she dies, you can put her in the command zone and get the tokens. This is... Uh, like a time bomb. If you just leave this out, you're going to lose. Yeah. It's going to be a 2020. Exactly. You build it up. Again, she is a payoff for all your, she, all your creatures that have a death trigger. And now when she dies, she has a death trigger. It's just... That makes that many creatures and then you get that many death triggers. If you have like a Zulpur Cutthroat, you only need 40 creatures to die. So if, let's say... <laughs> 20 creatures died somehow. Like, that's a good turn for you. Alenda does the other half for you. <laughs> that, I like, you made it sound like that was trivial. Trivial. 40 creatures dying in a turn? Easy for well, us. You only have to do 20 of the work. You only have to I, actually kill 20. I Nin know. 19. You, yeah, I just thought it was funny that you made it. You just saw just how, how trivial you made. It um, is trivial when you cut it in half, and everyone's not starting at 40 when it's like turn five. <laughs> Next, we have Athreos, God of the Passage. He's more of a non-token guy, too, because when stuff goes to the graveyard, you can choose an opponent they can choose to pay through life or put that card back into your hand. I vote that you bully someone, get them low enough, and then just get a free critical mass win out of it. Yeah, I've not, I've never been a big fan of this card. I actually don't think this card is good. That's my personal opinion on it, but hey. I don't know. It's just so cheap, and it's indestructible. I think there's something to be said for that. It's a really good um, cleric deck with the... Um, Shadowborn Apostle, but that's its own thing. Yeah, that's that's just a completely different it's deck. Not, yeah. like, that's not an Athreos deck. Uh, Marin of Clan Neltoth, classic. Whenever any creature dies, you're going to get experience counters, but then you want big, giant creatures to reanimate. Carador, Ghost Chieftain, my boy. Anything. Just as long as you're doing creature cards, he will do whatever you want. 
Yeah, both of these are more graveyard decks, but they also have they tend to have an aristocrat sub theme to them. Uh, both of them are very focused about putting creatures in your graveyard and getting them back. Um, but also, you're going to want to be able to sacrifice, put those things in the graveyard on your own volition. Yeah, if you mass reanimate, then you want to have a way to sacrifice them all and just create loops or just irritate everybody. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, next, we have Prush, Sky Raider of Kerr. This one, he comes out, he makes a ton of guys to sacrifice, and he's a sack of lead himself. He does too much. I don't like, this is one of those payoff enabler cards that I don't personally like, but it makes for a really good Aristocrats commander. See, I don't. I think Prosh is fine. I don't think he's that, he's, he's really good. I, just, I, I don't feel like he's too broken or insane. The next one, I feel like, is one you've pushed the card too far, and it's Corval, Fake Cursed King. He's completely insane. When he enters the battlefield or attacks, you sacrifice a permanent. Whenever you sacrifice a permanent, draw a card. And he gets a counter. And he gets a counter. Yeah, this card's completely stupid. I, I honestly think this card is way too pushed. Um, he's, he might, sometimes he's more of like a only caring about sacrifice. You don't even have to care about anything else because he's so insane. Yeah, he um he's your death payoff for sure. We're not advocating for this to be banned, but I think this is extremely lame card design when it's a payoff and enabler and insane. Yeah, payoff enabler and completely busted. The card's too good. Yeah, it, but not bannable. Yeah, yeah, and that's not, it's, yeah, the card, the card is boring. How about the card should have been worse? It's not too good. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. Uh, last one, Marchessa the Black Rose wanted to shout this one out because it's super weird. It's Grixis, and you want to, like, maybe steal people's stuff, but you always have to have ways to sacrifice them so that Marchessa can bring it back. Yeah, this, this card makes, like, mind control is playable. You take it with the mind control, get a counter on it, and then sacrifice it. Now it's permanently mind controlled by you, even if they try and kill the enchantment. Wait, you kill it because you're awesome. Yes, that is the commanders we have. What do we name? Ten there real quick. Those are, like, the ten that come to mind kind of the most stereotypical baseline. Now we get to talk about the specific cards. First, starting with the best sack of lets. If you're building an aristocrats deck, this is your, you just won the lottery because we're going over the entire art. This is a deep dive. Yeah, this is a deep dive. Uh, so first you need sack outlets. What are the best ones? Well, for free, we have the Viscerous Seers, the Carrion Feeders. Those two are completely insane. They're one mana and they they have Sacrifice Creature colon, which is completely awesome. Yeheni, another one, just another free sack outlet. Also, very hard to remove. I've been wanting to try this card in a deck uh, a lot because I just feel like it's it's so annoying to remove that maybe it's just going to be a great threat all the time. Well, it's not just that. It also, if a board wipe comes down, she just is a 10-10 and will then attack somebody for 10. Yeah, I, yeah. this card seems really good, and I've not tried it yet, but I want to try it. Woe Strider is basically just a three-mana Viscera Seer. If you can't get your hand on Viscera Seer, get your hand on a Woe Strider. And we talked about Yawgmoth. That card's insane. It also goes in the 99 of, like, every Aristocrats deck that ever exists. Yeah, this card is completely and utterly insanely pushed. And if Yawgmoth was in the Throne of Eldraine uh, commander decks, he would enter the battlefield and make three tokens. Yes. <laughs> for you to sacrifice. <laughs> like, I don't want to do any work. <laughs> All right. Other colorless ones, they're also free or cheap enough. Ashnod's Altar, Phyrexian Altar... Astro's Altar, Phyrexian Altar, Viscera Seer, and Carrion Feeder are like the tier one. Those are the best of the best. Making mana just lets you storm off if you have death triggers, and it's just not even going to be close. Yeah, I mean, Ashnod's Altar and Phyrexian Altar all have, both have a ton of infinite combos because there's just so many ways to go. Sometimes you're going to accidentally go infinite in these kind of decks because of these two cards. They're just, oh, I can just keep doing this thing over and over. I guess I win. I thought I was going to start drawing cards, but... I'm going to make infinite mana. I win. Yeah, I actually just won the game. Sorry. Uh, Spawning Pit lets you sacrifice your creatures to put... Uh, what kind of counters is it? I think just charge. Spawn counters. Pit counters? Brute counters? Yeah, pit counters are funnier. Uh, it puts pit counters on them, uh, and you can remove two pit counters to make a 2-2. Two -two. So you can turn your creatures into more creatures. Yeah, but it costs one mana to make the 2-2s. Two this card is, like, overperformed for me. Yeah, it's a very good card. It, oh. When you're going to get board wiped, you turn it charges all your guys, and then... You can still pump out half that many tokens, and then those tokens can still be sacked to Spawning Pit. I think Spawning Pit's one of the better ones, too. Yeah, Spawning Pit's very strong. Uh, Alter of Dementia, this is a win con on the other side, because if you have any infinite loop here, you're just going to mill all your opponents completely out. If they have an Elder Rousey, obviously you're not going to be able to do that, but you're still probably going to be able to do it. Yeah, uh, Yawgmoth and uh, Alter of Dementia, also Tier 1. The fact that you can just win with this thing or mill yourself to find what you need. Oh, if you have a flashback card that you can win the game with, just mill your whole deck, and yeah. then you win. <laughs> yeah, Goblin of Marmot is also, like, all these are tier one. We're only talking about tier ones here. Goblin of Marmot's insane. I mean, this one gives you the drain. If you just have enough creatures, it just gets to shoot people in the face. I mean, if you have any drain with it, now it's dealing two damage per sack. I guess we're just saying Yehenny and Woe Strider are not tier one. <laughs> yeah, I guess that's about it. Yeah, but they're still really good. There's not even anything wrong with them. They're, they're budget for sure. Definitely good on a budget, because they're free. 
Uh, the Priest of Forgotten Gods is okay. This is like a Fleshbag Marauder plus Sack Outlet, but it's only once a turn, but it draws you a card and it adds you mana. I think it's a little slow, but it's it's pretty sweet. It's just, it's a once a turn, yeah. These are the once a turn ones. The problem with this one is you can't you have to untap with it. That's the weakest part of it. And we we've talked about in the past how things you have to untap with tend to be a lot weaker than things that can just come down and do their thing right away. This uh, is a good card in your deck, but it's not a good sack outlet. Yeah, that's fair. Um, Phyrexian Tower and High Market are both lands. One adds two black mana when you sacrifice a creature. The other one gains you a life. Uh, both are very good. Phyrexian Tower is completely insane. High, uh, High Market is just great. Phyrexian Tower, honestly, it feels unfair. I have decks that don't even care that much, and I just had a Phyrexian Tower. Like, it's better than Swamp in a lot of decks. Yeah, sometimes. It just yeah, it depends on how color intensive your deck is. But yeah, it can just be better than Swamp in a lot of cases, especially when you have lots of spare creatures. And I think it's finally starting to go up in price, too. Yeah, the card's good. Uh, next, we have the best death triggers. What are we looking for when creatures die? So, the first one are drainers. Uh, Blood Artist is the one that drains for anything dying, not just your stuff. So, that one, I, I do like this next one more than it because it cares about your stuff. And hits each opponent instead of just one. Zulaport Cutthroat and Cool Celebrant, they're both the exact same, basically. One's in... Uh, Orzhov, one's in mono black, but whenever a creature you control dies, you drain each opponent and gain one. Wow. The longest reading of Zulaport Cutthroat in recorded modern history. <laughs> but I, th I actually, um, Blood Artist has upside over Zulaport Cutthroat. It means that they can't go infinite. They lose if they go infinite. Yeah, I, yeah. I think Blood Artist is good, but I just think in your Aristocrat stack, the Zulaport Cutthroats and the Quill Sovereigns are better. They're more aggressive, I guess. Maybe Blood Artist is defensive for a trigger, and then Zulaport Cutthroat is aggressive. Let's go with that. Uh, Bastion of Remembrance makes a 1 1 and is an enchantment. It's really just harder to remove, and it's probably budget. Same with Poison Tip Archer. Each other creature, and then each opponent loses one, is what it says. Yeah, uh, Poison Tip Archer is solid. It's just, it's a really good card. It's like randomly just. This weird green black aristocrats card. Yeah, this one more than the rest of them stop. Like they really don't want to board wipe because if there's ten creatures, they're each gonna lose nine. Blood artist would say there's ten damage total that I'm dealing, and Zulaport would say all of mine deal damage. But if ten creatures die from everywhere, it deals nine nine nine. Yeah, the difference. Yeah, poison tip archer is the only one worded like that really for the most part. Well, speaking of worded like that, this one is worded the best way ever that anything's ever been worded. Yeah, this one is Sir Conrad the Grim. I mean, he's five mana and he's still very, very playable. Whenever anything dies, each opponent loses one life. And whenever, well, and not just dies, put creatures put in the graveyard from anywhere, meaning the top of the deck, which he has a mill ability. Or from the hand, maybe you're making them discard. It's just whenever you check state-based actions, each opponent takes one damage. <laughs> they, there's nothing. This card can easily take over games. You can just... Play him on tap and then just spend your turns milling until he dies and you'll you'll probably get there. Yeah, I mean <laughs> PZ lost to this and it was oh, hilarious. Man. It was a one on one too. There weren't even any other players and I was at like ten and he just was out of gas, except for Sir Conrad. He's like, All right, let's mill, you know, twenty cards total. I died. You milled like three creature four or five creatures in a row to die. It was great. Yep, it was really brutal. It's it a was, good card though, I can't be mad. Yeah, it was completely hysterical. Uh next we have when creatures die. Draw cards. Midnight Reaper, Grim Horror Specs, we went over earlier. They're both three mana creatures. They come down and they draw when your non-tokens die. There also is the enchantments. Uh, what is it? The, the like black, black, black enchantment. That oh, draws. Dark Prophecy. I don't. I haven't liked that one as much. I, I think I, I like it if you have a lot of tokens. Cause it, yeah, because that one checks that's, tokens. That's the only one that doesn't care about tokens. So if you have enough tokens in your deck, that's when you start caring about that one. But these other two are better in general. You're going to play them more often than the Dark Prophecy. But... High tokens, maybe go with Dark Prophecy. Uh, and Liliana Death Horde General, or Dread Horde General, is amazing. One, she minuses the sack, uh, which is super good because it gets rid of two year. <laughs> We've talked about this. It's like an eight for one, especially when you don't care about the sacks at all or you're getting any advantage off of that. And she has this little static ability on her. Oh, yeah. Uh, you draw when you sacrifice a creature. You can't even call it an eight for one. You're not spending a card. She's still there. Yeah. <laughs> I, it's like just an eight. You just get eight. It's an A for, a for zero, and they have to answer your Lily now. Yeah, that's just complete. And, I mean, you're a token deck or an aristocrat's deck, so you still have stuff up, and they just lost two creatures that could attack her. Liliana's like the Conrad of, of Death Triggers. She's just crazy, but more expensive. Uh, then we have Grave Pact and Dictate of Erebos. I haven't really been huge fans of these. Dictate of Erebos is better. If anyone's wondering which one's better, I like Dictate better because it has Flash. Sure, I sure do wish I'd spec on Dictates back 
when Theros came out. Yeah, they were cheap for a while, uh, especially because they were put in some random deck, I remember. And the poopy Born of the Gods, which is like nobody cared. Yeah, that's true too. Um, But yeah, no, I think these are good. Um, I've seen them out on the field plenty of times and just control the board. They're really, really strong. I guess it really matters how much controlling the board is important to you. So if your meta is combos and, you know, out of the graveyard and some surprise things, this isn't going to do anything. But if it's like a... A Grave Titan meta, this is going to destroy them. I mean, even even though, it, even something else, um, it's tough to rebuild a board state into a Grave Pact or a Dictate because you know that they're just going to be able to produce tons of crappy, stupid creatures and then sacrifice them and just get rid of whatever you're playing. So you got to really just put like five creatures out and then hope they don't have some cool turn. Yeah, it's kind of disheartening. It can definitely take over games, though. Uh, Pitiless Plunderer, Pawn of Ulamog, Sifter of Skulls, and Annex, Hearted by the Forge, all make stuff when your creatures die. They're all pretty interchangeable. The only notable stuff is Pawn of Ulamog, Sifter of Skulls, and Pitiless Plunderer all make mana when they when the creatures die. So they're kind of mm-hmm. like um, Phyrexian Altar. Like, they do a little bit of an impression of Ashnods and Phyrexian Altars. Yeah, uh, Annex can make extra guides if they have big power, but they also cannot block, so that's very notable. One, one that's not on here that for Death Triggers that is totally awesome is... Mothra. Oh, baby. Whenever a creature dies that doesn't have flying, it comes back with a flying counter. That card is completely insane. Yeah, needless to say, it's white, and they have to be non-tokens, because otherwise there's no coming back. Also, same thing with Micaeus. Micaeus gives them all a dying. Yes, and that card's just silly. Yeah. <laughs> if you don't know how good Micaeus is, put it in one of your decks. Like, Don't even put it in with Synergy, and you'll still see how insane that card it, is. It's going to have an impact on the board. <laughs> all right, these are non-specific aristocrats core we just talked about the core stuff that you're going to need but these are kind of staples that we are happy to play yeah first we have skull clamp which actually can sometimes just be a sack outlet you pay one mana it's going to kill any of your x ones and then you draw two cards if you don't I, I i'm still on the train of banning this card i still think it's a very bannable card in edh but it's completely insane the strength of it is a plus especially for a deck like this yeah as good as it is it's disproportionately good in aristocrats x ones decks living death is going to win you many games especially if you're in the marin or carador varieties you just get everything back it's not even like it's like cheating i'm gonna play one card and now i'll get eight creatures oh and every other creature in play is is gone yeah you can sacrifice all your creatures first so that you don't even get board wiped. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Yeah, you. this is why you need so many sack outlets. You just put your whole board into your graveyard first. And so not only do you get all your creatures back from the graveyard to play, you also get all of your creatures from the play back to play. Yeah, this feels like an instant win type card where this is like the Protean Hulk of the Aristocrats deck where you're just like, eh, I win. Yeah, and if you're in the green varieties, if you're getting back a... Uh, if you're making mana with like one of the altars... Um, and you're getting back a Eternal Witness, you can just get back the Living Death. Yeah, then you get an Infinite Loop. As long as you have any way to pay it off, mm-hmm. you you win. Yeah, it's very strong. Um, Corpse Knight and Impact Drummers both say when creatures into the battlefield, something happens. Corpse Knight drains your opponent, and Impact Drummers makes them lose life. Or no, deals damage, rather. Yeah, it's basically the same thing. These are only if you're trying to like go super hard on tokens and entering and all that stuff. These are some of the worst, uh, quote-unquote, staples. Yeah, they're both, but they're both super good. And, and like, if you're if you're gonna make a ton of guys, Corpse Knight, Impact Chambers are both gonna do a great job. I've seen these cards in the. I've seen Impact Chambers more than I've seen Corpse Knight because Corpse Knight's two colors. But I've seen Impact Chambers just be super annoying. It's like, oh, go away, stop it. And it's an enchantment. You can't just wipe the board and expect it to go away. Smothering Abomination says whenever you sacrifice a creature, draw a card, and it must have been from Throne of Eldraine because it also says at the beginning of your upkeep, sacrifice a creature, <laughs> so it pays itself off. But it takes a turn. You don't really care about that. You just want to get it done right away. And this is going to super protect you from board wipes. I feel like this is the this is our like not quite. Th- this is not the A plus section. This no, is, it's not a staple. The smothering is not a staple. Yeah, exactly. Smoth- it's fine. Uh, totally reasonable. Uh, next, Chemer Guide, Revlark. Both of these are just they come into the battlefield. They have ETB. Well, one Chemer Guide needs to be to return stuff from the graveyard to the battlefield. Revlark, whenever it leaves the battlefield, returns stuff. But these two actually loop together with any sack outlet. So you add in any of your death triggers and you just win the game. Any creature in a sack outlet is infinite of that creature. These two are just complete best friends. They're both going to be good in your deck anyway, depending. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you're an all tokens deck, forget these. But these are A plus staples. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you play Chimeric Eye, you reanimate something, and then you sack it to get some sort of advantage, which your deck is designed to do. And then 16 turns later, you draw Rebel Arc and you just, oh, I win. Yeah, exactly, yeah. The, both of them are completely just, the, again, 
they'll function by themselves as strong cards. And on top of that, together they're just like, oh, we win. Yeah, to just respecify, I love it because the order you draw them doesn't matter. Not even a little bit. They both get themselves back. They both get each other back, so the order doesn't matter. Yeah. Uh, this card is for the green aristocrats decks. It's Birthing Pod. lets you turn creatures into bigger creatures, but all, well, half of your stuff is completely expendable. So you turn a token into a sack outlet or a sack outlet into a payoff. Yeah, this is a once a turn sack outlet. You use it and you just go up the chain. You make, you get rid of your things. Some of them are going to have, again, all the death triggers. That's what, yeah, focus on those death triggers because if you get a death trigger with any one of these, it's going to feel so good. It's like, all right, I'll just put this in my graveyard, draw a card, go get my best creature. Oh, mm, okay. Is, is that good? Yeah, I think so. The, all our creatures cost one, two, three, or four. <laughs> it's completely insane. Uh, Boss of Citadel, this is this is a big sack outlet. If you have enough critical mass, it just sacrifices to like dome everyone for 10. Yeah, let's not hammer home the busted first ability, but we can actually just take advantage of the second one. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Boss of Citadel is actually a staple of black in EDH, but it's a staple because we actually get to use the second ability in this deck. And you're gonna, it deals 30 damage. Yeah, it's a good card. Yeah, it is definitely a great card. Uh, or shards. Why, why do we have this one in here? Because so many creatures enter the battlefield yes. that, oops, it's a plague win for artifacts and enchantments we don't control. I just, it is extremely, extremely annoying. As soon as you, you can wait past turn three if you're worried they're going to kill it. As soon as you play aura shards and then make two tokens, all right, well, it's worth it. It paid you its card back. Now it's going to sit there and just tax everybody. Yeah, it's yeah, it's very annoying if you've never played against it. Um, and the last one, Field of the Dead, this is just... Um, for Aristocrats decks, it's perfect because it puts up, it just makes, it's a land slot that with a little bit of building around, especially in three color decks, it's just a little bit in three color decks. It's, there's some work to be done in two in one color decks, but there's like no work in a three color deck. It's just, you throw it in and oh my God, it's perfect. I love, a three color deck is like the perfect home for it because like in four colors, it's like, can you afford a colorless land? Yeah. Five colors, can you afford a colorless land? Plus it's three tapped. Colors, it's like, I can't afford a colorless land, and I have enough lands to choose from that I don't even have to struggle. We might disagree, but I, I think Field of the Dead's viable in one color decks, two color decks, and three color. <laughs> Joe thinks more two and three. Yeah. Uh, yeah three is, the is I think, the main home for it. Two, two it, is not difficult. Two is not too difficult. Yes, I would agree with that. Especially with Snowlands. If you didn't know, you can play basics and snow basics so that Field of the Dead always has two free types for each color you have. So if you're a three color deck, you already have six types in basic lands. Yeah, I'm actually playing four in my my new Rakdos deck. I'm playing four of each, or five of each basic. Four of them are snow, because we actually care about snow in the deck. And then just, eh, well, I'll just throw in one of each of the other basics, because it's just got a, it's got the upside of being a different type for Field of the Dead. Oh, stupid snow lands. Yeah, I don't like snow lands. All right, so then we're going to move on to our favorite category, traps. These are cards I think you should generally avoid. Uh, almost regardless of power level, I mean, every power level is different. We think, hey, if you're trying to build an aristocrat deck basically at all, you can probably avoid these. They're usually not going to help you. Oh, you'll never guess what we have first. It's actually Grave Titan. Now here's the issue with Grave Titan. It actually doesn't sacrifice creatures, doesn't pay off creatures, is really expensive. Yeah. Hmm. Not quite there. Sorry, Grave Titan. Yeah, not quite what we're looking for in this deck at all. It's way too expensive. And again, if we want three bodies, we can actually get it for cheaper. Actually, this next card, which we wouldn't even advise playing. Gives you three bodies oh, yeah. for much cheaper, and it's Ministrate of Obligations. It's got after it's a two one that has afterlife two. So it ends for three mana and you, so you sacrifice, you get two guys. Uh, it's okay. It's not awful, but I've never felt the need to put it in the deck personally. I don't think anyone really needs to put this in the deck, and we weren't even gonna put it on here because this doesn't even register as an aristocrats card, but you saw it was in like a lot of EDH rec decks. A lot. It's really oh, weird. Geez. Yeah, well, maybe we're wrong about it. It is possible. It is three bodies for three mana, which is, that is a good rate. We'll give them that. Like, one mana per body is kind of where you want to be in aristocrats, but this one doesn't. It just has great. no flair, and there's no bells and whistles on it. And I think there's so many cards with those things that it just gets pushed like, down the list. It's like the 50th best thing. Uh, next, Butcher of We hate this card. It's not Dictated or Grave Pact, even though it looks like it is, it's way more expensive. I mean, Dictate has Flash, so it offsets the fact that it costs five, but this costs seven, and it's a creature. Yeah, I want to I wanna throw in with Butcher Malakir because I always pair these cards together in my head. Uh, Soul of the Harvest, or no? No. Oh, the six mana, six, six, Death Touch. What? Soul of... Man, it's the... Harvester of Souls. There it is, because it's Soul of the Harvest is the green one, and Harvester of Souls is the black one. Yeah, so Harvester of Souls, I, I, these fit together perfectly. They're just... 
They're the effects you want at way too much mana. Yep, and Lily is different because it's not even on token, and she forces things to die right away. And she has other text, and she's not even a creature. Yeah, that card's completely insane. Yeah, yeah. Lily is stupid. This card, that I don't think either of those cards are playable remotely. You want to run through the next three real quick? Uh, we have Doom Traveler and Hunter Witness. Those those are basically just they have two lives, one mana. You get a death trigger. It not quite worth it. Again. Um, you want to you have creatures that make your other creatures usually die, so you can take advantage of them way more than just one creature dies. It has two bodies. Eh. Now we're going to be at three elves. Got a package with passage, which I've talked about not liking at all. Definitely don't like it in the 99. It's, it does a good job, I think, in it as its own thing, but you don't need it in the 99. It's not going to help you. Yeah, I, I just, I, I'm so off this card. I've never, I've never seen it perform very well ever. In a, like, I've probably seen it like somewhere around 10 games. Is that a challenge? What? Is that a challenge? Oh, sure, go ahead, build it. Uh, man, when we do gameplay, we're going to have so many episodes where it's just going to be us building a deck out of spite. Yeah. There'll be so many spite episodes. Like, all right, Joe's building a deck that I uh, poo-pooed on, and now I'm going to build a deck that he poo-pooed on. Uh, this is my Phyrexian Arena deck. <laughs> <laughs> it's my Phyrexian Arena tribal deck. It's every tutor and Phyrexian Arena. <laughs> I'm going to have it on turn four. Every game. Arcan of Justice is a card that I played when I was 15, and I felt great. But this is 2021. So this is a 5-mana 4-4. Four, four. When it dies, you exile target permanent. It's 5-mana for, like, Vindicate. And you can do it over and over. You have to do it three times for free before this is even really worth it, which is never. So I, I just think just avoid this. There's so much better stuff at so much cheaper mana. And just play a spell over it if you want removal. Yeah. Just play English and Making. Yeah, uh, Awakening Zone. This gives you a guy on every one of your upkeeps. Think think about how we don't like Phyrexian Arena too much. And now imagine if instead of drawing a card, you got an 0-1. Yeah, it sacks for mana... But we just don't need, we're not ramping into like an eight drop. And even if we were, we'd rather just play some ramp spell that permanently ramps us. I'm, the Awakening Zone is really bizarre. I like its its other cousin from Beyond because it has other effects. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Still I, like Awakening Zone. Yeah, I agree completely. Uh, Victimize, I just don't think this card's good enough for EDH. Um, that's where so my, close. my opinion has come to it. It's just, you sacrifice a creature and you get back two creatures. I don't think that you're going to be getting enough mana advantage here. You have to have some big, splashy, scary things in your graveyard for this to be worth it. It's tough with Reanimate and Animate Dead and um, the blanking on the name, but the flashback card. Um, Dread something. Dread, Dread Return. Return. Where it, it, it's four mana for a Reanimate, and then it flashbacks to sacrifice three creatures, so it's free if it's in your graveyard. Mm -hmm. Those three cards just push this thing down a little bit and it's like how many do you want yeah exactly you don't you don't want to have your whole deck full of reanimate spells that would not be a very effective deck because how are you going to put those creatures in your graveyard if all you do is reanimate this one feels like a context choice because this card is good it's just like not there it's really weird yeah i think it's i think it just doesn't quite make it um mimic that you can talk about this one. Oh man i i thought i found the perfect deck for this deck that cares about weird tokens nope still bad it's just a three mana thing it sits there you have to wait for something to die yeah, sure, your things could die because you're the Aristocrats deck. Wouldn't you just rather reanimate it or give it a second life or give it Undying or anything else besides... And it's three mana. i just been completely disappointed by this. And I already thought it was bad. Yeah, that's fair. I mean, I haven't played too much of Mimic Fed. I thought it was good, uh, but never had put, got to play it. Uh, active Treason effects, don't don't go for this. It's too cute. Um, one, if you go for an Active Treason or any type of effect, often they can respond and kill your Sack Outlet, which means that... They can't even sack out, sack it. Um, it's a cute thing and it's a fun thing that you can do. Overall, not going to be great. It's good in the Marchesa deck where you get to keep the creature afterward. Um, but other than that, I would avoid them. There are overall. two exceptions. Two okay. exceptions. The Marchesa deck and that awesome deck we built that active treason stuff and then sacks and then does more active treasons with Teriel. That deck was sweet. Yeah, that's different. Yeah, those yeah those decks are different. Those are like. I'm not saying, again, with all these cards, these are traps, not unplayable garbage. I think you're just making a mistake. I don't. I, you can do whatever you want. <laughs> yeah, but, but being a trap. Well, what I'm saying is like being a trap doesn't mean it's completely unplayable. It just means like in general, if you fall, like if you're going into this deck, don't just be like, I'm gonna throw this card in because I think it's a staple. No, think about it and look for other cards that might do the same thing. Better. Yeah, I mean, look at Victimize. It's probably like the tenth best reanimation spell in Magic. But we have access to the other nine, so we just don't need to play it, even though it is good. Yeah, exactly. Uh, though if you're on a budget, Victor is probably great. Yeah. Um, why did you put Cultivate here? Because Cultivate has nothing to do with Aristocrats, and I think you're trying to maximize creatures and effects that give you bodies, and Cultivate doesn't do that. And I don't think Cultivate is some kind of must-include staple. I think it's not that. I would never play it. Because there's just so many other cards that do something similar, especially now that we have three visits, too. But those cards you don't need. If you're in green 
and you're doing the aristocrats thing, wood elves, farhaven elf, diligent farmhand, there's a ton of creatures that do the exact same thing. Yeah, there's the Dawn Treader Elk, there's Springbloom Druid, I, there's like eight, and you just don't need to go to cultivate. Yeah, you just not, yeah, you you can just have it on a creature and you want everything to be on a creature in an aristocrat's deck. Your deck just moves more um smoothly. Yeah, and the last one, attrition, it's sec versus a creature to destroy a non black creature. I think the main reason we don't like this is because you have this only can kill non black. If it hit all creatures, I'd be much more on this card and maybe happy about it. But I think missing one fifth of the creatures in magic is rough. Yeah, I've never been a huge fan of, like, gaming the colors or, like, well, there's no black decks in my meta, so I'm going to put a Christian in. Like, you can do that. I just, when something doesn't care about a color or only cares about a color, I just kind of stay away from it. I like things to just be generally good, not to worry about that. Yeah, exactly. Um, but not that this card's bad, but it's just not, not our flavor. Yeah, it's a little unreliable. I like to just, if I'm going to have answers to stuff, I want it to answer everything, yeah. typically. That's completely fair. Well, that is our video. That's everything you need to know and all of our opinions on aristocrats um, special shout outs to all of our patrons we love you all as much as we can without making you uncomfortable you guys are known as the booby babies which is a term of endearment here obviously surely this was the deepest of dives and if you want to show your support you can go to patreon donate some money monthly and then you know we'll have more money to make better shows you'll directly benefit from it or if you want even faster gratification with none of the work just go to the link, click the dis in the description, go to the link, click the link to the TCG player, takes you to the homepage, all right? You with me? Now you're on the homepage. Buy cards the way you normally would. All that matters is that you start with our link, which you will have, and we get a kickback on the order. You don't have to spend anything extra. It's free, and you're supporting local card shops. What? Yes, and TCG player also has sleeves. They have playmats. They have Funko Pops. They have... Bob Ross Funko Pops. They have deflated basketballs. Deflated basketballs. You can get deflated basketballs on TCG Player. Maybe not, but maybe. Richard Garfield's left testing shoe. Yep, left testing shoe. The right one got lost in the mail. Exactly. That's it. That's the video. We have to tip it, though. Yeah, what's your tip it about it, Life? It's your turn. I did the last one. What did you do? I don't remember why I did it. He didn't do I it. swear I did the last tidbit. He, he didn't do And it. then we kind of stormed off and did like three tidbits. Hmm. Well, we just released our um, the reserve list. Do you want to do any follow up points to that that people maybe didn't understand? Oh yeah, I would I'm sure they're watching now. I would love to do some follow up points. One, some of the arguments in in the comments are like maybe not. Let's not get specific because a if someone's trolling or being annoying, I don't want to give them any press. But like, let's not maybe generalize things. So but yeah, I was gonna say some of the arguments in the comments are completely. Weird. Weird. One is basically an anti-communism argument. I don't know how that... Um, I think I, I think this point really brings everything home. If every single Magic player has money and can afford Underground Z, okay, and they all want it for their deck, mm -hmm. and now we go to the point of everybody putting them into deck, there's not enough. Yep. Every, so this is a game, and the game lets you choose your game piece, and you build your deck and then you play with your deck. Every card in existence, except the reserve list cards, can be put into every deck, right? There's enough copies for everyone. And in the rare case that there isn't, there then become more copies when it gets reprinted and mm -hmm. people realize there's, the demand is higher. And then nobody's left without copies. So if everybody suddenly had the means to buy the Great Henge, guess what? They could. There's enough Great Henges. There's like millions and millions of Great Henges out there. So 25% of the people who play Commander want to play Great Henge, they now can. 25% of the people who play Commander want to buy Underground Sea, they can't, not because of money, because there aren't any. There's, yeah, exactly. And that I think that really is a driving home point to where our argument and where our solutions come from. It's like, what game offers you the pieces and then says you can't play with them? What game, like, well, League of Legends has like, oh yeah, you can play this champion, but there's only 300 of them. Like, yeah. No. Exactly. Think about how, un like, and like, you can say like, well, anybody can get them, but but not anybody can get them. It's true. But everybody cannot. cannot get them. And that is the complete problem. And we're just here to drive this home again because the comment section has been almost like eye rolling. Um, <laughs> I Multiple times, multiple times, Ferraris have been brought up. And I don't know what a Ferrari has to do at all with, and like, I'm not bring, saying what those comments said or specifics. If you want to read them, go ahead. But it's like, I have no idea. Where the argument that because some people can't afford a Ferrari, you're going to say that Underground Sea should be legal and commander. What? 
<laughs> I don't know. That that would be different. It would have to to fix that. It would have to be like, all right, the game of chess now allows Ferraris as a game piece, and we're never making Ferraris again. And you can play Ferraris in chess matches. It's like, well, and the Ferrari can move wherever it wants. It's like, well, okay, well, maybe you should get rid of Ferraris in chess. Yeah, I would. I think I, I think I would ban Ferraris. They give you. They seem to give you an unfair advantage in chess. It's just like, oh, little Timmy didn't buy a Ferrari because there aren't any. You you have all the Ferraris. Yes. Uh, what I, do you, yeah, we're we're heading out. It's yeah. still no. It it just to clarify, oh. it's still the size of a Ferrari. You can just drive it over <laughs> the chess. Oh, the that's chess why you, that's why you win. Yeah, you just run over their king. <laughs> what about one of those? Uh, <laughs> how about this? You know how they have those human chests that are like people in costumes on a chessboard? Wizard's chess? <laughs> no. Okay. Uh, the the literal just life size chess pieces, but people. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. That's cruise ships. Yeah, but now you put in the Ferrari, and this just runs people over. <laughs> Can mow down people with Ferraris. Uh, peace out, Drive Scout.